We are going to be in Matthew 11 today, but before we get going there, I'm going to figure this is Thanksgiving week, and it's kind of like the forgotten day, right? Like we, we forget all about Thanksgiving other than the eating and such, but, but how often do we stop and just simply say thank you? And so I've got a, a list of things here I want to uh, make mention of this morning, uh, just things that I am faithful for. I am fa- faithful for a church that is faithful to God's word, a church that centers its life around God's word, God's inspired, infallible word of God, a church that is teachable, men and women and children that want to learn God's word. I am thankful that you come with Bibles ready to dig into God's word. I'm thankful that throughout our church building, we have preschool, children, youth, young adults, adults, adults with a little more wisdom, all committed to God's word, all working together to serve so that the next generation can hear of God's faithfulness. I'm thankful for little things, even such things as a new mother's room that allows moms to be able to still be nearby if they need to go with their kids. I'm thankful for a handrail that goes down to our basement so that those who maybe aren't quite as fleet of foot are easier able to get down to be able to enjoy and fellowship and serving with one another. I'm thankful to see both our, our, our through the ages and our young adults ministry combined to serve uh, in our community and to serve uh, Randolph-Macon's campus and to see young people from Randolph-Macon here uh, Friday night in this building. I'm thankful that in both groups they are committed to make God and Jesus Christ known. I'm thankful that we have seen our first kids camp this summer. We've seen our first uh, disciple now here in our church as kids learn about the Lord. I'm thankful that this summer we were able to see groups start in homes throughout our community and pray that that will be a continuation as the, as the time goes on. I'm thankful for new groups that have started and new groups that will start, all with the intention of teaching God's word and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for a church that has been more than generous throughout this past year. I'm thankful for a church that over 25% of every dollar that walks or that comes through this church goes out to missions and ministries. Some of that directly affected within our ministry investment plan and additional to your faithful generosity. And the more that we are able to, the more we will continue. Just to name a few. This year, we were able to have uh, the Gideons come in who distribute God's word, and we were able to bless them with almost $1,500. We just, in uh, a month ago, hosted our first fall family outreach, just literally through the woods behind us here, with uh, a, a great group, including the Fix Ministry. We were able to bless the Fix with almost $4,000 that day. And we are now partners in the gospel with uh, the Fix. And working with them as they reach out to the broken, uh, those that need the hope that only comes through Jesus Christ. And just two weeks ago, we were able to hear an update from E3 Kids, our partner uh, ministry that we have worked with for many years as they work both uh, predominantly still in Kenya, but also in Guatemala, as well as El Salvador. Uh, We were able to collectively bless E3 Kids with over $9,000 The majority of that was you just spontaneously, uh, as the Lord led, uh, gifting that. Uh, If you are on social media, and I'm not, so I can't really comment a whole lot about this, but I know if you follow E3, you will have seen that just in the two weeks since uh, Carol was here giving the update, uh, a church has been built in Bangladesh, which is a slum in Mombasa, Kenya, uh, one of the worst slums in all of Africa. Uh, Thousands and thousands of people live in some of the most uh, poverty-stricken areas uh, that we could even fathom. But we now, because of your generosity, have had a church that has been built, and we're obviously talking very simple (laughs) uh, means, but a church that has walls, a roof, and a floor where people will come. And uh, Pastor Francis has sent uh, multiple times thank yous for your generosity. We will show more of those in the coming weeks. We were able to, just past week, uh, had Mile One Mission with us. Mile One Mission is planting churches in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. 
Uh, Stephen Bray preached last week, and if, if you weren't blessed uh, by, by the word of God that he brought last week, whew, it was powerful. But we were able to present them a check for $4,000 to continue the advancement of the gospel. Uh, their heart is to see 17 churches planted uh, throughout that area. It is statistically the least church area in all of North America. It is less than 1% evangelical, and that's being incredibly generous. That's counting uh, Salvation Army churches uh, that have probably not done much to advance the gospel since the days of William Booth. Uh, so those numbers are, are even greater. It is a rapidly growing uh, area with many young people and young people who are devoid of the gospel. Uh, we were very fortunate. I shared a little bit Wednesday night, but to share a little bit more, uh, they were here, uh, and, and Keith can attest to this this week, with us at our state convention as we were working to garner more partner churches, churches that will come alongside, uh, send teams to Newfoundland and Labrador, churches that will come alongside and partner. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, churches, I've seen a lot of ministries in, in my years, uh, but I've seldom seen one more effective in raising up young men for the gospel ministry, for the work of the gospel. Uh, they are raising these men up to send out to plant churches in hard places. Uh, they are doing the work of an evangelist. They are going through a, a two-year residency. So to be able to support them is not just even to support the work that is there, uh, predominantly uh, St. John's and throughout Newfoundland and Labrador, but will stream across Canada and ultimately even our own country as we need more gospel advancing churches. Just this past Friday night as well, we were able to pack, I know at least 450, I don't know if it may have been more at this point, shoe boxes. Uh, Trent carried them all individually, one by one, uh, down to the collection center. But each one will go with the gospel. Uh, this is the beauty of Samaritan's Purse, is it is not just about a shoebox, it is about the gospel that will be sent. Uh, even to date, we know we've collected over $3,000 to help with the cost of those shoeboxes going. And if you even go back further into the year, we have seen your faithfulness shown in, in literally record numbers and uh, giving to Lottie Moon last year. Christmas and into the early part of this year. Uh, Annie Armstrong offering this year uh, was a record gift of over $12,000. We were able to bless the pregnancy resource of Center of Richmond with over $5,400. All of these may sound like numbers, but all of these matter, and each dollar is being used to further advance the gospel. Uh, so I am so thankful for that, that you have done that in the midst of our church continually uh, to increase its, its, uh, its scope and its breadth. So your faithfulness has gone a long way. Uh, we have been blessed here in just the last three months uh, to witness, to see, to meet over 20 of our IMB missionaries. I want you to understand that I don't know this factually, but I don't know that in the 130 years of our church we've seen 20 of our INB missionaries here and that in the last three months alone we have seen 20 come through not only these doors but stand here in front of you asking for us to partner with them not just in the gifts that we give through Lottie Moon's Christmas offering not just in the fact that we give to the cooperative program as a collection of Southern Baptist churches to advance the gospel but that we would be as William Carey told Adam Fuller that I will go down the pit if you will hold the rope we need to be a church that continues to do this. In that vein, I've got on the front row this morning, I've got a box of thank you cards, and they're not for you because they're blank. Unless anyone like, anyone like getting a blank thank you card? Just doesn't have the meanings. Amen, Miss Debbie? Miss Debbie writes the best thank you notes, and she has been a blessing and encouragement to so many here and others who are as well, but she has done this for so long. So what I'm asking you to do, I was able to uh, spend some time this week. I just spent uh, Friday night. Uh, with uh, um, two of the missionaries that were with us uh, three months ago. Uh, they are headed to a, uh, an undisclosed location, a, a closed country, uh, to the gospel. Uh, they are going with their two kids uh, where we typically won't go across the street. 
They are going into a difficult area, but the thing that I'm hearing more and more and more from our missionaries is they are, uh, in many cases, alone. And it's not the alone that you think of as far as, yes, they're going to a foreign land, they, they may not have uh, friends and family nearby, but for so many, they're, they're sending churches, pastors are coming and going, and they're just not having the, uh, the support that they once had. And we're not talking about Financially, We're just talking about encouragement. They need to know that there are men and women and children that are praying for them, and not just by lip service alone, but by actually doing so. So I'm asking you today, I would really love to not see cards in that box because we've got two more boxes. So I really, if we can't get rid of one box today, we're really sad. Don't be shy. If we have to go get another box, that's good. There's a couple different cards in there. I know you will not know the names of these missionaries, but that's okay. You write this card and showing your appreciation, put a prayer in there for them, and these will all get delivered to our IMB missionaries. There's 120 currently at the International Learning Center here in Rockville, and 125 children with those 110 missionaries. But think about it, it was 3,600. We have 3,600 missionaries right now serving through the IMB, and you have seen 20 of these adults, not to mention the kids that have come through here. I want us to be more than even just, uh, uh, I want to see us be a sending church. I do. I pray that God will, in his time, raise up men and women and families that will respond and that they will go. But until that time, I want us to be a fully supportive church. I want us to be a supportive church that is not only given to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which does start uh, in, a ne- in the next week. Uh, the week of prayer for foreign missions is December 3rd through the 10th this year. So I want us to really take seriously uh, during that week of praying each day uh, as the prayer prompts will come out from the IMB. But I want us to, uh, to be supporting. You'll see more of this as our mission uh, wall out there starts to come to fruition. So uh, write letters. Uh, the, the sad statement right now is even though we're seeing uh, great numbers of missionaries that are ra- responding to the call, uh, we're seeing them pass other missionaries in the airport coming back because as missionary families uh, and their kids are getting uh, older into the teen years, it gets harder and harder. You can only imagine. You, you see what is happening in our own country in areas of mental health. And you see the effects it's having, not only on families, but on kids. And could you imagine right now, you are in a foreign land without the resources that we have. You do not have the support of family and friends uh, that you can just uh, go and run to. You are in many cases alone, fully trusting though in the Lord. And you're never alone uh, when the Lord is there. But we need to encourage them because a lot of these families that have gone and surrendered, uh, their sending churches are no longer uh, staying connected to them, again, because of turnover in so many pastorates. So I am asking you to help us to continue to uh, reach out, to do more, to write these thank yous. Um, If you ever want to, I mean, we are beyond blessed to have within 20 minutes of where you sit, Every single uh, Southern Baptist missionary will have to come uh, uh, when they leave to go on the foreign mission field and when they come home. Uh, We will see probably next week, quite possibly, uh, the team that was here last week will be back with us. I'm just humbled beyond just words uh, at the the texts and emails I continually get from from uh, uh, from our missionaries. Uh, the, The group that was here last week, Michael Cross is the, the is the team lead there, and just his encouragement and and what he felt and the encouragement he felt here is is the greatest gift I can get in terms of just uh, knowing that they felt your love and your appreciation. So I am thankful for you. I am thankful that you are responding to all that God is doing, and don't lose sight of that. The enemy has a way of 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 throwing little things that just don't matter in the big picture to get in the way of a movement that God is clearly behind and the relationships we've been able to establish are mighty. So I wanted to share those thank yous with you this morning and I would encourage you and continue to be faithful as God is doing a great work. Amen? All right, I feel like Jimmy Fallon writing thank you notes. Two of you got that. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to do the first part today. We're going to finish it next week. And then after that, we're going to take a little break from Matthew, and we're going to walk through the book of Ruth. Uh, If you've never walked through Ruth, I'm encouraging you to do so. Uh, We're going to do it together, so I encourage you ahead of time, read through four chapters. won't take you but about 15 minutes, and that's reading at a pretty leisurely pace. Uh, Read through Ruth, and we will see Christ all throughout the pages of Ruth. 
So Matthew 11, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, being Christ, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you have, what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, God, that, Father, we do not take it for granted. Um, we have it on our cellular devices. We have it in multiple copies and translations around our homes but god may we be in your word and may it get in us so father even this morning may you give us ears to hear your word that you would speak by your spirit through your word into our hearts and that god we will be forever changed as we advance the gospel of jesus christ and we pray in christ's name amen so we've made it to the 11th chapter uh, through these first 10 chapters of Matthew, we see all of them as Matthew is written to a predominant Jewish audience. And each one, he is showing us testimonies declaring the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. We see from the very beginning in chapter 1 the, the testimony of the history and the genealogy that points to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Then we see through the testimony of the virgin birth, and conceived by the Holy Spirit that again testifies that he is deity. Then as we continue into the third chapter of Matthew, we saw we're first introduced to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, a prophet of God, a, a man filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, testifying that behold the Lamb of God. Then we see as Jesus is baptized by John down in the Jordan River. The Father proclaiming, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We see the Trinity there in that one act. Then as we go into the middle chapters of uh, we've been through, 5, 6, and 7, we see the testimony of the very words of Christ as he delivers the great Sermon on the Mount, as he proclaims his deity. Then as we get into chapters 8 and 9, we see the further testimony of his works as he heals, casts out demons, raises the dead, forgives sins, all testifying to his deity that he is in fact God. And then finally, as we over the last few weeks uh, looked at chapter 10 of Matthew, we learn of his testimony through his disciples as he raised up these 12 men, as he sent them out, as he gave them a very specific mission to a specific people at a specific time, and then warned them of what they would expect to receive, that they would face opposition that there would be those who would oppose the message of the gospel as there are still today. So as we come into chapter 11, we see that when Jesus had finished instructing the 12, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So as he has sent them out, he will continue on with what he has been doing. But as we get into verse 2, chapter 11, verse 1, is kind of a, a closes out chapter 10. But remember, chapters and verses are not inspired. They were not written in by Matthew. Uh, they were added in the 1400s, so you have to still understand this. This is a continual uh, uh, letter that Matthew would have wrote. But as we get into, into verse 2, we see this interesting story. It says that when John, and this is talking about John the Baptist, the very one that we read about in chapter 3, the very one that we will read about in chapters 14, we, we hear a lot about John the Baptist. It says that when John, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus and asking, are you the one who is to come? So the first thing we're seeing this morning is that John has, has some doubt. This is his response to doubt. Now, this is, uh, this is arguably Jesus himself saying the greatest man that ever lived had doubts. Not doubts about his salvation in Christ alone, but he was doubting, is this in fact the Messiah? He believed it was, but he just wanted that confirmation. Maybe you have had those seasons in your life or that time that, that doubting has crept in. J.C. Ryle, the Anglican, said, Doubting does not prove that a man has no faith, but only that his faith is small. 
And even when our faith is small, the Lord is ready to help us. Well, we see John struggling a little bit. He is in prison. He is uh, facing uh, a future death. So it gives us understanding a little. But even when we look to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, notice in, the chap in chapter 28, these are the two verses that precede the Great Commission. We know the Great Commission, but notice starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Notice the 11 disciples. They have already witnessed the crucifixion. They have now witnessed the, the risen Savior. And yet as they fall down, as they saw him and worship, they still had doubts they were still as Paul says they were still in some ways working out their salvation not to the extent where they were doing anything to add to it but they were still growing and learning and they had doubts John the Baptist the, the forerunner of Christ the very one who announced the very coming of Christ the, the end, if you would, of the Old Testament prophets. We, we don't often think of that, but John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Remember that there had been a 400-year silence with no word from the Lord. To put that in perspective, consider that our country is not even 400 years old. So for 400 years, they had not heard the voice of the Lord. They had not heard, thus saith the Lord. There had not been a man of God who brought forth God's oracles, who brought forth God's truth. But here, John the Baptist, he, he raises up John. John is pre-appointed to be the forerunner. He is a cousin of Jesus. His mother, Elizabeth, was a cousin to Mary. John, who said, I must increase he must increase and I must decrease. You see, John did know Christ and he had already pointed people to Christ. He had even baptized Christ. He had affirmed his faith in Christ. But even John asked, are you the one? Or the literal translation is, are you the coming one? The coming one is a title for the Messiah. It is a messianic title, much like the seed of David, the king of kings, the prince of peace or in this case, the coming one. We see that in the book of Hebrews, as the author of Hebrews writes in chapter 10, for you have need of endurance, so that when you, will, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. This is speaking of the imminent return of Christ, that Christ is the one who will return and take his rightful place. Now, it may be, you may think, well, maybe this is a question of his, uh, that maybe John didn't truly ever believe. No, that's not the truth here at all. Uh, the word in the question implies that John truly did believe, uh, but he was having some, uh, some, some perplexity as to just understanding what it was uh, that Christ was doing. Understand where he is. He is in a prison cell. He has been imprisoned there by Herod Antipas. He is literally saying this, should I continue to believe what I believe or should I believe something else? He understands, he says, I believe that you're the Messiah, but am I wrong? Because he is still believing that Christ will ultimately overthrow the oppression of Rome. We see in John 20 also uh, another who doubted. Many of you have, have heard the name Doubting Thomas. Here in verses 24 through 29, it says, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again in the room and Thomas was with them although the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you isn't it always interesting the very the details here that uh, Matthew wants us to know the doors were locked 
and they were locked from the inside. Anybody ever seen a lock on the outside of a door? That's usually a shed, but not your house. The doors were locked, but yet Jesus appears, and he says, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, because he is omniscient, knowing all things. He knew Thomas had his doubts, that Thomas was still uh, had his questions. He says, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to them, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's part of what we'll see in in Jesus' own testimony here in Matthew 11. Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preacher, says that some of us who have preached the word for years and have been the means of working faith in others and of establishing them in the knowledge of the fundamental doctrines of the Bible have nevertheless been the subjects of the most fearful and violent doubts as to the truth of the very gospel we have preached. I take great comfort of that coming from Charles Spurgeon. Literally, arguably, the greatest preacher of the 1800s and probably since then. And yet, even Charles Spurgeon had at times these struggles. He struggled with depression. And that's quite crazy when you consider uh, all that Spurgeon did. Started over 66 different ministries through the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle there in London. received over 13,000 members in his tenure at the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle. 13,000. That's larger than the population of Ashland. (laughs) In one church there that proclaimed the gospel. So why was John doubting? Why do we doubt? Well, circumstances can sometimes lead us to that. If you remember the story, Herod Antipas was ruling Galilee, and he had visited his brother in Rome, and when he saw his brother's wife, he coveted her to the point where he desired that he wanted her. So he took her for his wife, divorcing his own wife, stealing his brother's wife. And when John heard about this, John said, that's not right. John called him out. He did not write an anonymous article. He didn't put it on a blog post. He didn't put something out on social media. No, he went face to face with Herod Antipas and told him he was a rotten, vile sinner who was an adulterer and gave him the whole, the whole spiel right to his face. Well, you can imagine this did not go over really well with Herod who proceeded to throw him in jail. So now he is in jail after having stood for God and having stood for God's truth. This man, who was, in fact, a true saint, a prophet of God, he was a great, holy, faithful, selfless, loyal prophet. He had done exactly what God had told him to do, and he had done it well. He had announced the glorious coming of the Messiah, who would make all things right and set up his kingdom. He had even uh, taken on the Nazarite vow, which was the highest level of spiritual commitment one could take. But he struggled because of the circumstances he was in. Maybe you have had doubts because of circumstances you've been. Maybe you went to the doctor not expecting the news that you heard upon your appointment. Maybe you struggled to hear of a disease or some sort that you had now been diagnosed with. Maybe you struggled because you have heard of the news from a loved one or someone dear to you that has been given fatal news. Maybe you've struggled to doubt as to how could God, where is God in this? circumstance because our circumstances can cause us at times to doubt but notice what Jesus says Jesus is going to answer John's doubt and he speaks to the crowd in verse 7 concerning John what did you go out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken by the wind notice these are all questions what then did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. But see, John also maybe was still looking for the political figure that would ultimately overthrow Rome. He expected this is what Jesus would do. You see, the Jews were looking for someone who would rid them of the oppression of Rome. They wanted a political savior, not a personal savior. Now, John did believe in Christ alone, 
But still, he had to have just wanted more. He believed that there was possibly, uh, that, that Christ would be their answer to the oppression they faced. But notice the response that Peter gives just a few chapters later in the Gospel of Matthew in 15 chapter. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? It's the same question he asks us every day. Who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you and I? Simon Peter replied that you are the Christ. That the is very imperative here. The Christ, the Son of the living God. There had been others who had claimed to be a Messiah. There had been others who had even claimed to be the Savior. But none could be the Savior. None could be the Messiah except for Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon understood this and proclaimed this boldly. Jesus answered, and blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this profession of faith, Peter confessed Christ. But yet we will find Peter in just a few chapters after this, denying the fact that he even knew Christ at all. We all go through seasons where we will struggle, where our faith will be stretched to its limit. We go through times that we're not sure which way is up and which side is down. But through all those times, we can hold fast to Christ. John the Baptist in Matthew 3 was the one who came saying, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Can we just sing about that? Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Does that sound like someone who would have doubts? This is a dude's dude, okay? This is like the MMA guy that you don't even look at, much less step in a ring with, all right? John was as unkept as they come. He never owned a toothbrush, a toothpick, or a, or a hairbrush or anything else. He lived off the land, trusting the Lord would provide. He wore camel skin. How many ladies in the room, can I get a witness, have camel skin clothes in your, in your wardrobe? Anyone wearing camel skin today? No, not comfortable. Not exactly the type of apparel one would, uh, would wear regularly. He was a rugged man, and yet this man had doubts. He never doubted in Christ alone, but he struggled still with his faith. But notice, as I read that verse, he quotes from Isaiah. So what did Jesus do? Jesus quotes Isaiah back to John he simply says John look in your Bible do you want to know if I'm really he read the Bible look to the Old Testament prophets of old and see that all that had been proclaimed all that was prophesied did I not fulfill them John I get it things are not exactly the way that you thought they would work out anyone been there the things you thought was going to happen just haven't always worked out Sometimes we have to go through struggles. Sometimes the Lord takes us into those struggles to get us to where he wants us to be. John would ultimately give his life in that prison cell. He would not even ever again see the light of day. But he quotes Isaiah to John. He sends his disciples back to John with these verses. John, look around. And then he says this of John. What a testimony. He says in verse 10, speaking of John the Baptist, this is of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger for your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. 
No one was greater. Not Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. Not any goat that we stick on the name of any great sports figure or anything else today. We love to put everybody as the goat. They're the goat. Well, there's only one goat according to Jesus, and that was John the Baptist. And how do I know that? Because Jesus said, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. No one. And yet he still had this struggle. John, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, it says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he, was, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. On strictly human terms, there had never been one greater than John the Baptist. But notice the very end of chapter 11. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Greater than John the Baptist. The one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than he. John Owen said this of John Bunyan. He said, he said that I would, be, that I would gr- gladly exchange all of my learning for Bunyan's power of touching men's hearts. And if you know the story of John Bunyan in, ni- in 1660, not 19, in 1660, he was arrested for illegally preaching the gospel, for not having the official permission of King Charles II. He would spend the next 12 and a half years of his life in the Bedford County Jail, not Bedford, Virginia, but Bedford, England. Although this was a time of great suffering in Bunyan's life, Bunyan's years in prison were quite productive, as he wrote extensively, with only the Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs beside him. He published during these 12 and a half years titles such as Christian Behavior, The Holy City, and A Defense of the Doctrine of Justification. And of particular significance, what he wrote during these 12 years was his life story entitled Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Sound familiar? That's what the Apostle Paul called himself, the Chief of Sinners. Bunyan did not waste his imprisonment. He was actually uh, released in 1672, took up a pastorate in the very town, in the very community he had been imprisoned, having been appointed there by the congregation that year. After a few years of fruitful ministry in 1675, Bunyan was again imprisoned for preaching publicly without a license. Amen, (laughs) right? Amen. It was during this imprisonment that he began the first part of his most famous book, which many of you know and have read, The Pilgrim's Progress, which was to sell more than 100,000 copies in its first 10 years in print. In the late 1600s, it sold 100,000 copies, copies in the first 10 years. He did struggle, but Bunyan, much like we see here in the life of John the Baptist, but His faith was in Christ. John Owen says that there are two things that are suited to humble the soul of men, a due consideration of God and then ourselves. Of God in his greatness, glory, holiness, power, majesty, and authority. Ourselves in our mean, abject, and sinful condition. You see, we need to understand that there is only one who is great, and it is not I. In Matthew 18, as we get ready to close here, uh, this passage is entitled, Who is the Greatest? In uh, one of your subscriptions in your Bible. It says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's a hard truth. Amen? Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Because if you remember, even James and John were were arguing over who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to sit on your right hand and who's going to sit on your left hand in heaven? Uh, Jesus and and, and Jesus uh, set them straight really quickly. Those sons of thunder became sons of dunder really fast John Stott says that the greatness in the kingdom of God is measured in terms of 
obedience. We see, we, we talk a mean game. Christians have one of the, we talk a lot. But does our life truly measure up? Now, we are blessed beyond measure. We live in the freest and by all accounts still the safest country in the world. And if you don't think so, go overseas and go to countries like China and Afghanistan and Iran. But witness what the church is doing. The church is exploding. The church is faithful. The church is committed. When I was uh, having dinner Friday night and... Um, for years, I was in Moscow a number of years ago, and every turn we took was uh, a Korean missionary. It was really, I mean, literally they were everywhere. And, um, but yet in our discussions now, even South Korea is receiving tons of missionaries as their young people have turned to secularism and humanism. It's, it's, it's all across our landscape here in this country as well. So John the Baptist, Jesus says of him, he is the greatest. And then he continues to say, from from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent taken by force. There will always be opposition. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. 400 years of silence until John the Baptist. And it says, "And and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Elijah in the spirit. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds." If we are to be faithful, it must play out in our lives. That means in our faithfulness to being part of the body of Christ. That means faithful to serving the body of Christ. That means faithful to to giving and advancing the, the kingdom message. You know, we're one of a few countries in the world that the church is not advancing. We are in retreat mode in America. We are seeing fewer and fewer people come to faith in Jesus Christ, even though we have more churches, more pastors, and more resources than any other country in the world. Why is that so? I'm going to say it is because we have forgot what we were saved from. John Christostom was an early Christian, and this is what I'm going to close with. It says, when the great John Christostom was arrested by the Roman emperor, he sought to make the Greek Christian deny his faith and recant, but he was unsuccessful. So the emperor discussed with his advisors what they could do to this prisoner. Shall I put him in a dungeon? The emperor asked. No, one of his counselors replied, for he'll be glad to go. Would we? He longs for the quietness where he can delight in the mercies of his God. Then he shall be executed, said the emperor. No, came the answer, for he'll be glad to die. For he declares that in the event of death, he will be in the presence of the Lord. Well, what shall we do then, the ruler asked. There's only one thing that will cause him pain, make him sin. He's afraid of nothing but sin. I don't believe we actually grasp that. We have made sin our pet. We have justified our sin based on our current situations. Folks, brothers, sisters in Christ, do you and I understand today that our lack of obedience is sin. Our lack of obedience to the Great Commission is sin. We do not fear sin because we do not fear a holy God. If we truly understood the weight of our sin, that it was our sin that held Jesus to the cross, that he imputed on us his righteousness, but he took our sin upon himself. And that if we are to truly live free in Christ, then we must realize we are his. That we were purchased with a price and that we are to live lives in such a way that it brings glory and honor to him. Folks, consider how you and I live. We live in luxury. It's just a reality we do. I get that there are people in our country that still struggle, but by and large, we are living in the most luxurious times of history. And yet we give the Lord table scraps. And then we're the first ones who want to stand in line and call out something. Do you understand you and I are accountable for that? 
you understand that we're going to give an account to the Lord for all he has given you and I? I don't know about you, but I'm not looking forward to that day because I know what I squander. Folks, let's do what, our, do what we can as the Lord leads us. Old Vance Havner used to say, until a man's wallet's converted, he ain't really converted. Now, whether you believe that or not, that's, that's irrelevant. But I'm telling you, if you're not faithful with what God's given you, he may just well take that from you because it's not yours. It is his. And if you're not faithful with that, then that is sin in your heart because the Bible is very clear about us and our giving of ourselves and all that we are. Start somewhere, folks. Serve faithfully. Start allowing God's spirit to, 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 to convict you in areas that you need, you need to allow him to. And watch as he does pour out blessings. It's not prosperity. It's far from that. If anything, it's going to cost you more. <laughs> because the more you give, you're going to realize, you know what? I've got so much and God is continuing to bless. Let us trust him that he alone is worthy. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that, God, your word challenges us. And, God, we are called to obey all that you have commanded, not just parts we like, not just uh, sections that seem to fit well within our current uh, lifestyle. But, Father, even the hard passages that are hard, that's why they're called hard passages. And, God, we need the help of your spirit. Father, we need you to... God us. We need you to give us wisdom and discernment. Father, we need you, God, to just break our hearts with the lostness that is all around us. We live amongst a, a nation of plenty, which is, makes it at times harder and harder to reach people because they don't need you. But Father, may we not settle for that. May we be a praying people. May we pray desperately and earnestly for the lost. And then may we go boldly with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are far from you. God, you present us opportunities every day that we squander. And Father, I, I as well, I, at the front of the pack, God, that times that you have given us to be faithful and we choose instead to simply turn and walk away. God, may you turn us to repentance that we would be men and women that are faithful to the gospel, willing to risk whatever that entails, still probably minute compared to what so many of our brothers and sisters all around the world will face. And as we just, it's, we, we, we look at this month as a month, we, we look at the persecuted church, but Father, we, we be reminded every day of so many brothers and sisters in Christ who truly have given their all. May we at least be willing to hold the rope but for so many of us, Father, we can't get our hands dirty. The rope might burn. The rope might have something on it. Father, may you forgive us, and may you draw us to yourself, and may we live in the freedom that is only offered through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.